Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. If uh, folks could please have a seat, I apologize for the delay in getting started. My name is Pam Pearson. I'm the director of the International Crisis for Climate Initiative. Uh, we are also a member of the Clean Arctic Alliance, which is hosting this uh, side event on the low-hanging fruit of black carbon and shipping in the Arctic. And the reason this is so important is because shipping is a small but extremely intense and important source of black carbon and therefore warming especially when it comes to Arctic sea ice. Uh, we're very lucky to have a really broad representation of people working and living in the Arctic today. And we're also going to be ending up with something that sometimes is you know, not spoken about as much in this context of Arctic sea ice and shipping, and that's greenhouse gas emissions from shipping, which are also forcing the demise of Arctic sea ice. Um, after our session, if you haven't done so already, I'd invite you to take a look at the um, toppled or toppling, as we say, Tobler. Uh, we have here in the cryosphere pavilion, which I know those of you online cannot see, we've normally had for the past two years five dynamics represented. The important global parts of the, the global cryosphere, mountain glaciers and snow, ice sheets related to sea level rise, permafrost and polar oceans, polar ocean acidification, freshening and warming. All of these are impacted to some degree or another by Arctic sea ice, what the extent is, what times of year it's there and is not. And we made a decision this year in conjunction with Arctic sea ice scientists to show the representation of Arctic sea ice as actually toppling on its side because the IPCC Working Group 1 has determined, this is for AR6, the sixth assessment, that that ice in the summer, the multi-year ice, is inevitably going to disappear, even if we're able to pursue the very lowest emissions pathway, uh, and that will likely happen before 2050. And so we're representing that as our toppled uh, totem this year. And there's an explanation of why that decision was made and the, the scientific literature behind that decision on the wall. Um, so without any further delay, I wanted to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Robbie Mallett from University College London, who is a sea ice expert in the Arctic and uh, actually will soon be taking his expertise to Antarctica and sea ice there. But uh, today he'll be telling us why the system is so important and why it is so sensitive to shipping and black carbon in the Arctic. So, Robbie, please. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So I'm just going to give a, an overview of, of, of what is Arctic sea ice, what is the Arctic, how is it changing? Uh, and how is that relevant to shipping and how is shipping relevant to Arctic sea ice? So my slide's a little clipped, but this is a picture of uh, what's happening uh, in, in a lot of the Arctic, which is a tourist ship. And this is called the Commandant Charcot. It's a French uh, tourist ship and it's breaking through ice. And it's breaking through ice because a lot of sea ice in the Arctic is thinning. And there's almost uh, an air in the, in the tourism sector of last chance tourism. So People are being interested in climate change and they want to go and see it. And this is an emerging, uh, it's emerging opportunity for a lot of people in the Arctic, but it's also an emerging threat environmentally. So I showed this plot a little earlier, but it's important to get a sense uh, before we talk about Arctic shipping and black carbon of how quickly the Arctic is changing. And it's changing uh, in a large part because it's warming really, really fast. It's warming well over three times the global average rate. So the blue line represents the recent increases in global average temperatures. And that red line there uh, indicates the, the average temperature north of 66 degrees, so north of the Arctic Circle. Um, and that region of the world is warming much quicker 
and we're seeing sea ice decline, which you can see on the right-hand side of this slide as a result. So as the temperatures go up, uh, the sea ice can, can recharge and grow less in the winter because it's much warmer and it melts much more quickly in the summer because it's also warmer. So uh, in many ways, this is actually a very simple situation. Uh, it's getting hot and the ice is melting. So here I just wanted to, to illustrate two really important shipping routes in the Arctic. They're by no means the, the only shipping routes, uh, but they're, they're the ones that are most typically talked about. On the left of the, the right-hand side panel, in, in the red dash, you can see the Northwest Passage through the Canadian archipelago. Uh, and on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the Northeast Passage through the Russian exclusive economic zone. And you can see that the purple, uh, the purple splodge on the right is where sea ice was in September of this year. Uh, and that's, that's a subset of where it was at the beginning of the satellite record in 1979. And that's, um, that's causing a lot of changing, changes and it's causing a lot of opportunities for, for shippers to move through a region of the Arctic that was previously muggled to move goods through. Uh, and not just goods, much much more difficult to, to do tourism in, much more difficult to extract resources like fish, uh, oil and gas, um, and, and minerals. So uh, we, we can see just over the last 40 years that the sea ice has, has retreated away and it's opened up uh, space for ships to move. And, and I showed this slide a little bit earlier, but it's also become a lot thinner. So as well as, as, well as retreating in the summer, the ice is much thinner in the winter and, and ships can actually break through that, specially designed ships like the one on the cover slide, uh, ice breaking ships can transport goods and people through that ice, even when it's present because it's thinner. Here's some, uh, some news clippings that I, that I clipped. So, uh, not this summer, but uh, not this winter just gone, but the one before. We saw the first two-way passage in winter of, of LNG ships moving between Russia's LNG terminals on the, in the east and west sides of the, the northern Siberian coast. And that, that was really significant for the shipping community. It was also really significant for the people that lived there and, and also the scientists that observed this, this rapidly changing environment. So uh, the, the second uh, headline that I've put there is that ship I showed on the first slide uh, the Commandant Charco that went to the North Pole in summer. Uh, and, and 30 years ago, that, that would have been unheard of. 30 years ago, breaking through the thick old ice that, that loitered near the North Pole would, would have, yeah, I mean, you'd have been laughed at if you suggested you were going to do that. But now uh, that's, that's entirely possible for, for, a, for a ship to do in summer. Uh, the, the recent Arctic Ocean Mosaic expedition also did the same. They, uh, they just drove there in, in September. They just, they just powered their ship through the thinner, younger ice to reach the North Pole. Um, and I alluded to this earlier, the final headline there is, is talking about, uh, in this case, the US ambition to, to potentially extract oil and gas from the, we call them shelf seas because they're very shallow. They're, they're typically uh, between, between 50 and, and 400 meters deep. Uh, and, and they contain uh, very large oil and gas reserves. So this is an emerging issue of governance, uh, but it's also uh, an emerging issue in terms of how are we going to supply these, um, these platforms to extract these, these materials if they go ahead? Uh, and how are these ships that carry tourists and how are these container ships going to move through when they're burning uh, what's often described as bunker fuel? So um, you can walk on bunker fuel, put it that way. It's not like the, the gas that you fill your car with. Bunker fuel is a heavy, dense material uh, that is much more environmentally damaging when it when it's run through the engines of these ships. So the type of the type of fuel that most of these ships that move through the Arctic run on, um, it can be pretty environmentally damaging. It's greenhouse gas intense, but it also emits uh, aerosols into the environment, some of which is called black carbon. Uh, when that sits on the 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 ice and the snow surface of the, the sea ice and and also, more, more alarmingly, the, the terrestrial snow and the land ice, uh, that makes it much more absorbing to solar radiation. And I, I'm not going to go too deeply into that because we have some real, real field experts that are going to go into that issue, but I just wanted to introduce it. I think it's worth saying also that this, this middle ship, uh, the, the Commandant Charco, is, is an interesting example because it has electric engines uh, that, that, that can be powered either through charge or by diesel engines. And that represents... Uh, 
a unilateral advance by that that agency that runs that ship. And it's an example of how if we if we want to, if the relevant organizations come together, there is actually uh, a way for people to to use the Arctic, to explore the Arctic, uh, to, to, to make to make the most of, of the, its resources if, if they choose to do that uh, in, a, in a much more environmentally sustainable way uh, than is happening right now. So it's not it, it, well, that's the title of this session. It's a low hanging fruit. It's entirely possible uh, to, to greatly um, improve the situation. So uh, th these, are, these are the three things that I've just touched on, these issues of transarctic shipping. Uh, it's, it's not just the, the sessions about black carbon, but transarctic shipping also brings issues of invasive species and also the large, um, the large greenhouse gas emissions of the ships. The resource extraction, again, we've got the black carbon issues, but we also have the emerging issue of oil spills and how those would uh, relate to sea ice cover and, and whether we can whether we can remediate potential oil spills in the same way that we can in open ocean, and also what the impact of that will be on the, the ecosystems and the people that live there. Uh, and, and finally, tourism, as I've just discussed. So I'm going to hand over to the next speaker now. Uh, but I think my, my closing note would be, there's environmental change going on in the Arctic, but there's also a radical recent shift in how humans are using the Arctic. So we, we need to pay attention. Thank you so much, Robbie. Our next speaker, which we're very honored to have here, is Lisa Hubukwaluk of the Inuit Circumpolar Council Canada, recently elected president, longtime international director also. And so she is very knowledgeable about these issues in different forums, and we're very lucky to have her here. Please, Lisa. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here with you today. I believe my presentation is up there. Yes, good. Um, yeah, I'm from uh, originally from Pouvernitour, which is in um, Arctic Quebec. It's in northern Quebec, where my family lives while I live in Montreal. But I always connect with my family who show me pictures of uh, my nieces and nephews, new babies and fishing out on the ice and enjoying bringing fish back home for the family to consume right from the fresh lakes that are now covered with ice. But today I will speak to you about how we are... Um, building toward alliances uh, with uh, uh, people that we meet in international fora and um, in different parts of the world uh, so that we may uh, build uh, strength and alliances towards uh, reducing emissions that harm our world and also impact our culture through loss of culture, loss of knowledge. Um, as you know, uh, us living in the Arctic has meant that we built our culture. And the foundation of our culture is also built around the knowledge we have of ice and the marine ecosystem, and the marine mammals, and uh, sea currents, and wind currents, and so forth. So um, I think uh, what I'll be presenting you is very much based on protecting our culture, protecting our knowledge. So we are all north and south dependent on a clean, safe, zero emissions global shipping fleet. And this is even more true for Inuit. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit first about who we are as Inuit. And we are a marine people, as I just said, who live in the circumpolar region. And our homelands transcend national borders, which makes us truly an international people. Inuit have rights to a vast coastline and marine region. We are over 180,000 people, one people, one nation, in four countries. 
our lands form Inuit Nunat that you can see in this map. It's the circumpolar Inuit homeland where we have occupied and used our homelands and Arctic marine environment for thousands of years. Oh, sorry. We are part of the Arctic ecosystem. Inuit culture and biodiversity are intricately tied. Importantly, we depend upon the Arctic sea ice, flow edge, and polynyas for food security. Our knowledge of the Arctic includes the ocean and coastal seas, migration patterns of marine mammals, current and wind observations, knowledge of the ice movements, knowledge when co-developed with science, builds a greater understanding of the changes the Arctic is experiencing that directly impacts shipping. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit mixed up with the... The Arctic Ocean and the ice connect Inuit to all other parts of the globe. I think we need to remind ourselves constantly that the oceans are all connected. It is one global ocean. The complexities between economy and environment require careful measurement and balance. Strategies that are developed, therefore, must include the distinct voices of those within our communities, the Inuit of the circumpolar region. Sorry. I'm mixed up with my papers. We know that underwater noise impacts our marine mammals. Our hunters can describe the changes in harvest patterns and availability of animals in highly transited regions in the Arctic. We are concerned about the impacts on our marine wildlife, collisions, disturbances of feeding areas. We are concerned about ocean dumping as this impacts our animals through pollution, contaminants, and invasive species. We're concerned about the potential for oil spills as we're not prepared and understand that a major spill would be catastrophic for our way of life. And of course, we're very concerned about climate emissions from ships. Inuit are on the front line of climate crisis. I'm so sorry, I, I feel lost in my presentation because I don't see the numbers. I'm just gonna go back and count, okay? <laughs> uh, three, four. So if I show you this slide, it's showing statistics that come from the Arctic Council report and that says, um, uh, that shows that ice is melting very rapidly at 13% per decade. And the year where animal annual uh, average sea ice volume was the seventh lowest on record is 2021. And we've seen this through other presentations as well. Of course, we're very, very concerned about this. And there's been a 75% increase in distance sail by vessels in the Arctic from 2013 to 2019. There's been also a 25% increase over the last six years in unique ships in the Arctic. Inuit are on the front line of climate crisis. Inuit Nunad is warming three to four times faster than the rest of the planet. And as the ICC, as the recent IPCC report outlined, the loss of ecosystems and their services has cascading and long-term impacts on people globally, especially for indigenous people who are directly dependent on ecosystems to meet basic needs.
given these dire predictions and already observed impacts, action to reduce climate emissions from shipping is urgently needed, particularly black carbon, a short-lived climate forcer, which is 20% of shipping's carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. It has a disproportionately high impact in the Arctic. Black carbon emissions must, from shipping must be reduced and eliminated. So far, voluntary approaches like the recent MEPC, Marine Environment Protection Committee resolution at the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which is a good step to switch to cleaner fuels, haven't worked. We need mandatory regulations and quickly. We are also concerned about the shipping industry's increased methane emissions. It is a potent greenhouse gas, so reducing global sources will benefit the Arctic. A major source and future source of methane is in the shipping industry of the LNG, which is a marine fuel, and support Supporting alternative marine fuel sources will become more and more important as we go into the future. I'd like to talk briefly about a renewed initiative that we are now uh, working on at Inuit Circumpolar Council, Many Strong Voices. The vision for many strong voices is to promote the well-being, security, and sustainability of coastal communities in the Arctic and small island developing states in the Pacific by bringing these regions together to take action on climate change, mitigation, and adaptation, and to tell our stories to the world. The vulnerability of communities both in the north and south bring authentic, powerful voices for change and jointly aligning and putting forward an ambitious climate and ship pollution agenda at the IMO will hopefully increase urgency of member states to act. ICC's status at IMO presents a unique opportunity to develop new global alliances. Inuit share many of the same challenges with the indigenous peoples and other citizens of small island developing states. These challenges include a dependence on the global shipping fleet for resupply, economic development, and transportation. Shipping is critical infrastructure in our respective worlds. One very pressing issue which has common cause with our Pacific friends, the impact of black carbon perpetuates the most pressing ecological problems faced by both regions. Ocean acidification causing coral bleaching is driven by black carbon deposition and ice melt is also catalyzed by black carbon deposition. I'm not sure why those symbols are appearing. <laughs> Working towards efficient, clean, zero emission and safe Arctic shipping is in all our best interest and will require a collaborative effort. It's because shipping is so important to Inuit that we began an engagement with IMO. ICC has participated in the IMO over a number of over a number of years now, and we have listened and learned. We have attended IMO meetings under different states, but also under, under NGOs. But we know our small and mighty voice is unique at this important forum and warrants its own consultative status. IMO consultative status for ICC will ensure that our unique and independent voice, our Inuit knowledge, perspectives, and issues are heard within this important decision-making forum. Our intricate knowledge, awareness, and experience within the Arctic and the views of our people are all important elements of our contribution to the IMO.
So we're hoping to continue and build partnerships with other shipping states that are dependent and impacted by global shipping, such as the small islands developing states. We have a lot in common. If we can find solutions to reducing black carbon by decarbonizing the global shipping fleet, we will protect both the coral and the ice. Inuit and indigenous peoples worldwide, in particular, those with a direct profound and spiritual relationship with oceans, coastal seas and marine environment have inherent rights to these territories and resources as affirmed by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples among other international covenants. Our relationship with the marine ecosystem is critical to our well-being and way of life. This is the end of my presentation. Daima, as we say in Inuktitut, the end. Nagomi. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and it's especially really inspiring and important to hear about the cooperation between North and South here, between the Inuit and the um, small island developing states. We have now a video from uh, the Honorable John Kautoke from the Kingdom of Tonga, uh, Embassy to the UK, mm -hmm. representing South Pacific Island populations and their point of view in this issue of black carbon and the Arctic. Good everyone. My name is John Kautoke, Kautoke and I'm an advisor on ILO affairs with the Kingdom of Tonga. It is my pleasure to be speaking to you today on our South Pacific perspective of reducing black carbon emissions. On behalf of His Majesty, the Board of Cities from the Government, I would like to thank the Clean Arctic Alliance for organizing this event. I am grateful for the speakers from the entire Plutonium in the system. I welcome all those. I come from the Kingdom of Kong. A small Pacific island world in Sweden, located in the heart of the country. With a population of a little more than 100,000 people, we are one of the smallest countries in the world with impermanent population and magnets. Our ocean territory is vast, which makes us a large ocean state. For over 3,000 years, our people have called the islands of Mama Cole. Over the centuries, we learned to live in harmony with the ocean. The Pacific Ocean has always been a total free, an available highway, and a place where we derive meaning for our existence. And now, because of the climate crisis, the very thing which has sustained us for so long may also be a source of our alpha. Over the past half century, we have been forced into a climate crisis with the basically non existent global and related. Within that same time frame, Pacific island countries have become some, if not the most vulnerable countries in the world to the effects of climate change. With increasing frequency, severity, and intensity extreme weather events, and natural disasters. Coupled with extraordinary events such as pandemics, the effects on our countries can be extremely critical, especially if we consider that our Pacific Islands already face connectivity boundary due to our relative isolation. To illustrate this, in January of this year, Tonga was hit by a global disaster. A volcanic explosion which triggered a tsunami. The effects of the double natural disaster is to be built on the country today. My own family home was one of the hundreds of homes that were destroyed by the tsunami. And this at a time when the country was being impacted both socially and economically by the coronavirus pandemic. Moreover, 
Give them a time and not fully recovered from the benefits and effects of the category of our tropical tea. Struck the country in 2018. This was followed by another category of our cycle, which struck in 2020. In this slide you can see the baby lists standing on the walls of the program following the same. On top of all of this, all onset events such as sea level rise also seem to be a threat every year. To some of our Pacific neighbors, sea level rise is an extended threat, which could lead to the erasure of their physical and legal reality. I am sometimes doubt why Tonga and the Pacific have no interest in what happens in the night. And my answer is always short and simple. What happens in the Arctic happens close. In addition, the challenges we face in the Pacific are also shared by communities with Nino. These communities who call the Arctic to a home. Like them, we are isolated. Shipping is our lifeline. Like them, communities are threatened by sea levels. Finally, like them, we share the risk of losing our identity and sense of belonging if our environments are swept away by the destructive effects of climate change. We Tongans, the Kaiyakers, we always share the cause of the vulnerable who are affected by climate change. The Kingdom of Tongans form a great policy principle. It's the friend to all and the enemy of God. It is a foreign policy of friendship, but it is also one of compassion. And it is one that realizes that we may be in different boats, and we all fix this. This storm is climate change, and we have a chance to do something about it. The IPCC report on impacts on patients and liabilities is that when it concludes, that the scientific evidence is going to be wrong. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window for the level of It is with this concern in mind that we cooperate as a group and as a people to tackle climate change by merging our collective voices in both ambitious reductions in greenhouse gas emissions an accelerated uptake of greener and cleaner forms of energy, particularly in the near term. One of these important forms is the International Maritime Organization. Thomas' engagement with the IO began in 2000 when it acceded to the Convention of the International Maritime Organization. Since then, we have continued to engage with the organization's work during the IMO's mandate promote safe, secure, environmentally free, sound, efficient, sustainable ship. As a country that relies heavily on imported goods, international shipping has been and remains a lifeline for Tonga and other Pacific states. The goal of engagement with the IMO has sought to ensure that this lifeline is not also contribute to a platform for greenhouse gas emissions. In this respect, Tonga has ratified MAPO of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships. We have also ratified the six technical annexes to MAPO. Of key interest to Tonga is the MAPO 6, which focuses on preventing air pollution from ships, improving energy efficiency, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from ships. We have engaged with the Marine and Environment Protection Agency of the NFC and other subsidiary bodies, including the International Working Group and the Reduction of Human's Gas Emission Projects. For the upcoming NPC and ISWG sessions, our participation in these meetings are aimed to push for the highest ambition possible for the reduction of human's gas which is 100% unrelated in the 
to push for a basket of measures with focuses on the greenhouse gas level and a global fuel standard. To push for the inclusion of the world of air to protocol. To push for an equitable country that is no country itself. In conjunction with these innovations, we call any idea that will have immediate beneficial effects on the world of the crisis. The work to reduce black carbon emissions is well set in the Black carbon is a short lived climate force responsible for around 20% of people's climate impacts. When it settles on the snow and ice, it accelerates water and the loss of the water. This in turn exacerbates local and global water. However, black carbon is short lived, and so the reduction of emissions have been needed by the conference. It is in the interest of all to support work towards the recovery and the elimination of black carbon, particularly in the development of an emissions control area and the inclusion of black carbon in the market access. To this end, Thomas notes that a high emission correlation on black carbon is in submission for consumption. The position on black carbon and our support for the Inward Serpent World Council is and will be based on the alignment of realities we both face with the challenge of climate. The threat to our livelihoods and our respective living ecosystems. Towards this purpose, we see this coalition as a clear path forward towards our target of obtaining the highest ambition possible and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions which is 100% renewable income. At this critical time time, with the greenhouse gas strategy about to be revealed, now more than ever, Pacific States of the IMO stand together, both for high ambition. It is our hope that we can affect the maximum amount of the international shipping to grow the IMO. We wish to see the realization of the utmost and green chip in our lifetime, one which does not contribute to the world's new climate crisis, but in our environmental predicament. We want a shipping sector and be an example for other sectors to follow. And we want an equitable transport which leaves no country behind. We want this to be part of the legacy that will leave future generations. Urgent and ambition, ambitious action must be taken to improve it. And we are all called to do our part. In the upcoming, we have hundreds of the Pacific Bloc stand ready to work together in finding lasting and equitable improvement. We are also happy, and I love you. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Fatiman Kalkoki, and I'm an advisor on IMO Affairs in the Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presentation and speaker is a virtual one. Uh, Dr. Sean Pryor, director of the Clean Arctic Alliance will be speaking to us from London on Arctic and Black Carbon, where she's been participating actually in IMO meetings. Can now we can hear you, Sean. Yes, welcome to uh, Sharm El Sheikh. Yeah, we're not seeing your screen yet, so hang on for a second. It's coming. Okay, you're up, we'll maximize you, and then share your screen, please. You're now on screen. Great, I'm unable to share my screen, I to share the presentation. Yeah, um, if you could go in and enable screen sharing or simply make Sean a co-host. Okay. 
It's coming. It's a. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sean. Go ahead. Sorry about that delay. Um, thank you very, very much. First of all, um, I would just like to say thank you to the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative uh, for their amazing development and organization of the Cryosphere Pavilion and for the opportunity for the Clean Arctic Alliance to organize an event here today. And I would just like to say thank you now that I have the floor to all of our speakers today. The Clean Arctic Alliance is a coalition of 20 non-profit groups formed around seven years ago. Our work is focused through campaigns to change shipping practices impacting the Arctic, and in particular to reduce black carbon emissions from ships impacting the Arctic and to address the risks associated with heavy fuel oil spills. We have members with consultative status at the International Maritime Organization and at the Arctic and Nordic Councils. Some of the bodies that have the ability to agree to action to reduce ship, ship emissions that impact the Arctic. Uh, we've already heard quite a lot about the climate disaster, um, so I'm not going to go into very much detail now, but I did just want to remind ourselves of the work of the UN Secretary General from earlier this year, and indeed he's again made dramatic interventions uh, earlier this week. Um, at the opening of COP27. We are on a fast track to climate disaster. Major cities underwater, unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, widespread water shortages, the extinction of a million species of plants and animals. This is not fiction or exaggeration. This is what the science is telling us and all the what will result from our current energy policies. I think nowhere are many of these consequences being felt more strongly than in the Arctic. Just to quickly recap, as uh, a number of the speakers have already touched on some of these elements already, uh, the Arctic is an important ice habitat for wildlife, a unique ecosystem which supports huge productivity of plant and animal life in the oceans. And as Lisa has just said, this is a highway and provides cultural identity for the Inuit people and other indigenous communities. It is also a major climate regulator, and it is now considered by scientists to be warming as much as four times faster than the rest of the planet. We are experiencing unprecedented seasonal ice loss, permafrost storm, and increase in ocean temperatures. There is now high confidence that increased weather and climate extreme events are exposing Arctic communities to acute huge insecurity. Declines in sea ice extent and volume are leading to a social and environmental crisis in the Arctic, and cascading changes are impacting global climate and ocean circulation. There is high confidence that processes are nearing closely on with rapid and irreversible changes on the scale of multiple human generations are possible. There's long been an interest in sailing ships through the Arctic, and some of the earliest European Arctic explorers had as their primary objective to find routes through the ice to the Pacific Ocean and vice versa. And as already mentioned, already been mentioned the seeding of sea ice has resulted in renewed interest in Arctic shipping. As Lisa mentioned just now, the Arctic Council reports a 25% increase in shipping in the Arctic in the five years between 2013 to 2019, and a 75% increase in the total distance sailed by all vessels during the same time. Increases are in particular being seen in the fishing domestic sector and the bulk carrier sector. Uh, bulk carriers in particular driven by the uh, need to export or, or the desire to export minerals being extracted in the Arctic. 
And it's not just on the transit routes that are being shown in the, the first slide there, or the pictures there, but that's it. But also on the what we call the routes, uh, that's shipped traveling from Europe, North America, or Southeast Asia, and use the Arctic and back out again. Uh, but also on the intra Arctic routes, so routes that are purely based in the Arctic. And this, uh, it was mentioned earlier as well, um, increasing traffic brings increasing risks and increasing threats from shipping activities. And I'm going to focus particularly on emissions of black carbon and of greenhouse gases contributing to the climate crisis. As I said, I'm going to focus, um, I'm going to focus on black carbon and I think our next week in Adelaide will talk a bit more about greenhouse gases more generally. And I want to focus on action that can be taken quickly this decade that can make a difference, that can reduce the threat. Black carbon is a short-lived climate pollution produced by the incomplete burning of fossil fuels. It has an impact that is over 3,000 times that of carbon dioxide on a 20-year global warming potential. It makes up around one-fifth of international shipping's carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, and when we release near the Arctic, it has a disproportionately high impact. Not only does it contribute to warming while in the atmosphere, it accelerates the melting of snow and ice when deposited onto the snow and ice. And that's uh, hence the disproportionate impact. But it's even worse than that. The melting snow and ice leaves darker areas of land and water reduced to cover by snow and ice. And these dark patches then absorb further heat from the sun and the reflective capacity of the planet's polar ice caps is severely reduced. More heat in the polar system results in increased melting, and this is what has caused the loss of the epidemic effect. Black carbon also has a negative impact on human health. In recent research has found that black carbon particles in the body tissues of, tissues of fetuses following the inhalation of pregnant mothers. The need to reduce emissions of black carbon because of both the climate and health impacts has been long recognised. On land, considerable effort has been made to ban dirtier fuels in power stations to install diesel particulate filters on land based transport and to improve the burning of broad, dry wood, and thick or to reduce emissions of black carbon on air pollution. However, at sea, the same efforts haven't been made, and in fact, the shipping industry has moved to using cheaper, dirtier fuels, also known as residual or heavy fuels, that can no longer be used on land because of the pollution that they cause. In recent years, efforts have been made to move shipping away from these heavy, dirty, high sulfur fuels to cleaner diesel fuels. Let me just repeat that to cleaner diesel fuels. These are the fuels that on land we are trying to reduce the use of. Uh, but to see, we're trying to get shipping to move away from even dirtier fuels to diesel fuels on the way towards the decarbonisation. However, initial efforts um, to who moved to clean fuels have resulted in the fuel and shipping industry responding by reducing the sulfur content of the fuels that, that were being used, but still continuing to use the dirty heavy, heavy fuels by blending them and treating them to reduce the sulfur content. These blended fuels unfortunately still have high black carbon emissions, and they continue, uh, the shipping industry and fuels, continues to use these very heavy fuels instances by installing exhaust struggles that remove the sulfur at the end of the pipe, and so certainly by using the international regulation to reduce sulfur content of fuels. Reducing black carbon emissions from ships isn't difficult. It doesn't require the development of new fuels or new technology, and it can be done with immediate effect. By switching to diesel or distillate fuels, Individual engines could see a reduction of around 42% for a four stroke engine and 70 up to 79% for a two stroke engine in black carbon emissions. And that's simply by moving from heavy fuels to lighter diesel fuels. Moving on the ships currently operating in the Arctic and using heavy fuels uh, could result in as much as a 44% reduction in black carbon emissions. 
and so in the diesel particulate filter will reduce that carbon emissions by over 90 percent so really this is your only fruit it's action that could be taken tomorrow by making better fuel choices and by scaling up particulate filter technology and storing filters on ships so what needs to happen well probably uh, a regulation that would require ships operating really near to the Arctic to move to ports which result in lower carbon emissions is essential. Then no one is at a competitive disadvantage and, and there won't be any uh, um, desire to um, any desire to cheat the system to get better to a better place. The map on this slide shows some of the reductions that could be achieved by five individual vessels operating in the Arctic in 2017 if they had used diesel fuel instead of heavy fuels. Designation of emission control areas is another uh, technique that could be used to reduce um, emissions of carbon. And in these areas, cleaner fuels would need to be used. And this can be an important way of reducing fuels beyond, uh, sorry, reducing back carbon sources beyond the Arctic. Uh, the drive into the Arctic once the black companies went up into the atmosphere. And then the development of the global fuel standards would also be valuable requiring ships fuel to be at the standard that would result in lower black carbon emissions. However, this does need to be considered alongside the drive to decarbonize shipping entirely as it will take some time and uh, decarbonization efforts uh, may overtake the development of global fuel standards. And it's not just global action that's needed through the International Maritime Organization. There's more that can be done at a domestic and regional level too. And in fact, there are already some leaders showing the way to go. Domestic bans on the use of heavy fuels should be introduced by, in particular by the Arctic nations, and no one has already introduced such a ban in the waters around the island of the of Svalbard. But more needs to be done covering the whole of the Arctic coastline and indeed reducing that carbon emissions beyond the Arctic too. The shipping industry itself should take action. After all, the health of ships, crews and passengers is important. Passengers having to wash their clothing because of the ship stains on cruise ships is such a great work. The Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators, that's the smaller cruise vessels that, that uh, operate in the Arctic, have already taken the decision to switch to disco fuels, and some are starting to test now the installation of filters to further reduce that carbon emissions. But this is just one small sector, and we need this action to be, um, to, to be spread out throughout the whole of the shipping sector. And then regional action, re regional regulation is also possible. Um, as an example, uh, the EU stick for 55 package of climate regulation could include provisions requiring ships that operate in and out of European ports and travel to the Arctic to operate in distant ports. It doesn't currently include provisions of that nature, but there do remain chances for further amendments to protect the Arctic before it is finally adopted. And there's no reason why similar action isn't possible at other regional levels. Of course, reducing ships that carbon emissions can be achieved in isolation, and as Lisa, Lisa has said, we need to cooperate and we need collaboration. It's essential as we've heard today from both John and Lisa that climate vulnerable nations and indigenous communities are fully involved in the decision making process. And I'm just going to leave you with the Clean Arctic Alliance's call to action. On our website, you can find the Arctic Ocean Action, where bodies with an interest in the Arctic can support the need for better action to reduce shipping impacts on the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, uh, this was very interesting presentation, especially giving some of the solutions that are possible and what needs to happen. So our final speaker before the Q&A is Madeline Rose of Pacific Environment. 
a long-term leader on these issues in the Clean Arctic Alliance and in the Arctic in general and in the Arctic Council. Uh, she's going to be speaking about shipping and greenhouse gas emissions. Ooh. Yes, I'm a bit tall. Sounds good? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to sort of close the panel here. And I'll just say it's um, always so funny to get to finally meet your colleagues in person when you travel to new places like Egypt. I think in my first year uh, working on these issues, Lisa and I met at like a three in the morning international maritime organization call. <laughs> so it's such an honor to finally meet you in person. So Pacific Environment um, is a member of the Clean Arctic Alliance. We're also a nonprofit with consultative status at the International Maritime Organization. So just to kind of round out the panel, I'll be talking about some of the solutions, um, underscoring some of um, what Sean just said around just immediate solutions for black carbon, but also what's the long-term solution on decarbonizing the ship, the entire global shipping fleet. So I'm just going to focus on kind of three big solutions from easy, hard to hardest. Um, and then I'll remind us about the easy. But so sort of the easiest solution, like Sean just said, we could ban heavy fuel oil quite literally tomorrow in any Arctic country, but also any country in the world. Any country in the world tomorrow as a sovereign port state could say that we are going to ban heavy fuel oil from being used in our jurisdictional waters. So jurisdictional waters in maritime law doesn't go out to the whole high seas, but it does have a longevity of impact. So, so you know, whether it's 12 nautical miles or 24 nautical miles or up to 200 nautical miles is how the European Union interprets it. Any country could ban heavy fuel oil and force ships to use marine gas oil, that lighter, more distillate oil, and that would reduce black carbon emissions by 40%, right? So that's something that any country could do tomorrow. If you sort of remember um, Sean's map, um, uh, sort of looking at the Arctic Circle, so Norway already has a heavy fuel oil ban in its fjords. Iceland has a heavy fuel oil ban within 12 nautical miles of their coastline. So we're really pressing Greenland, Canada, and the United States to move forward and ban heavy fuel oil in their waters. Again, that would be 40% immediate black carbon emissions, which would be a huge help um, to reducing uh, Arctic warming and, and sea ice from the fleet. So the second solution is slightly harder, um, but this is about, you know, how are we looking at the greenhouse gas transition for the full global fleet? And the short takeaway there is that we really believe that we can deploy the same to policy toolkit that has been deployed for cars and trucks. So on-road on transportation for off-road transportation. So, you know, you probably are seeing that the International Council on Aviation just passed a zero emission standard for airplanes. We're pushing for a zero emission standard for ships as well, alongside a, a sort of basket of first mover policies um, to accelerate that transition. So a big focus right now in California and the European Union, as well as China, South Korea, um, and Japan as sort of a first mover basket of countries that if just those you know five regional jurisdictions were to act in unison, they could effectively force the global shipping fleet off of fossil fuels. Um, we have a, is that me or them? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we have a couple of different strategies. Uh, one is called Ship at Zero. This is our corporate campaign, very cute, you know, personified ships, you have to like them. So shipatzero.org, this is a market pressure campaign calling on um, Walmart, Target, Ikea, some of the world's largest shippers to commit to move their products off of fossil fuel ships. We've had a number of commitments there. It's very successful. Um, it's just a good kind of market accelerator. So please feel free to join that campaign. And then, then we have this, uh, a new port strategy. So again, any every country in the world that has a major port, you have an energy transition that has to go on at that port. And then of course, the International Maritime Organization. So my colleague from uh, Tonga already talked about this, but basically a, a global framework that would reinforce those first mover efforts. 
Um, and then the third solution, which I think is the hardest and really is more of a conversation than uh, a presentation is, you know, what's our, what is our position going to be on reducing traffic? Um, do we actually want to reduce traffic? I think that picture that you showed of, you know, I, you know, climate tourism is, is a really uh, existential question that we all need to wrestle with. So to summarize, easy solution, ban, ban heavy fuel oil in Arctic waters tomorrow, slightly harder solution, but still doable, advocate for the zero emission transition for the full global fleet. And thirdly, are we going to advocate for reduced shipping in Arctic waters? So thanks so much. So Director Pam has gone off to change the world in another pavilion. So uh, I'm just going to moderate the, the Q&A. Uh, thanks all the speakers, by the way, for, for really excellent talks. And does, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I have a whole bunch. Uh, we, can we get Sean back up on the... Uh, on the on the screen as well, so we can we can hear Sean's input. If not, uh, Madeline. I, oh, we've got one. Amazing. Uh, do, do, could you come up to the come up to the front? We'll, we'll get you a, a roving mic. Just over here. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabby Ryder, the Pisces Foundation. I'm curious, um, like what you're all focused on this week here um, at COP and how you're seeing the work you're doing here, engaging with the negotiation processes and as well as the rest of the venues. Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, what, what are the speakers focused on at COP? Which negotiations are they, are they following to try and reduce black carbon? Uh, Lisa, do you wanna start? Oh, you're welcome to come up here as well. Uh, yes, <laughs> good question. As Inuit, we're focusing on uh, our position and we're bringing forward some uh, recommendations for our listeners to hear. So one of those is that um, discussions around climate action need to include um, us um, as a way, well, I'm complicating my statement. <laughs> Let me say it. We have the right, uh, we have the inherent right to self-determination. And I mentioned earlier, we live in four countries under different jurisdictions, but we consider ourselves as one people, one nation. And our inherent right to self-determination is recognized now through various international conventions now. So we express ourselves regularly by, by repeating this. Secondly, our indigenous knowledge must be utilized um, alongside scientific knowledge when we uh, discuss uh, public uh, policy, when we want to make decisions around climate. Our knowledge um, is really crucial to these discussions. So we want uh, constantly, we have constantly to advocate and promote our knowledge because it's not the same as scientific knowledge. It's also not uh, inferior to scientific knowledge. It's equally valuable. Um, I said earlier that our culture is founded in the Arctic environment. We created our culture around our knowledge of the Arctic environment, and we are happy to be home in the Arctic environment. So that's very important. The other is um, ethical, equitable engagement. We have developed uh, a set of protocols guide researchers, uh, that guide decision makers on how to engage with us uh, so that we're, we're not left behind, as a lot of people uh, are saying. Um, fourthly, access to funds for loss and damage, mitigation, adaptation. Um, as people living in developed countries, 
Greenland, which is part of Denmark, Canada, uh, Alaska, which is part of the United States. Um, as Inuit living in these countries, uh, we are considered to be living in developed states, but we don't have uh, direct access to funds. So what we're saying is, this is a false dichotomy between developing and developed states. It actually causes inequity. And we see ourselves being equal to other uh, indigenous people or even developing states. So we're saying, let's get rid of this false dichotomy and um, open up equity to, those, uh, to, to access to those funds. Lastly, um, and on top of all, all this list is the protection of our environment. We've been coming here participating at the COP for decades. There are previous leaders before me, my mentors and friends, who have come here for decades warning the world, look, there's a d disaster coming and we are now living this reality. So I come here and speaking to that reality today and saying we need to act now. We must protect the Arctic. We must protect our culture, the Inuit culture, from the impact of climate change. And to do that, we can't do it alone. The causes of climate change are from outside our area. So we must work with you. We must work together and stop the impacts of climate change, stop the causes of climate change. Okay, so that's my main message. Um, as indigenous people, sorry, and, and last point, <laughs> as indigenous people, um, we're not participating in negotiations, but we have an indigenous people's uh, platform and a facilitative working group that serves to bring the indigenous voice to negotiations. Thank you. Nakomi. Yeah, and I'll just say, so um, for this COP, we worked on two kind of outside of the negotiations, two initiatives. So the Green Shipping Challenge, which was just launched on Monday with Secretary Kerry, uh, well, with the United States and Norway. Um, so it's, it's kind of a uh, ambition mobilization effort um, Norway actually committed to reducing all emissions from the Norwegian shipping fleet by 50% by 2030, as well as pursuing that target globally, which would, which is effectively what the shipping industry is responsible for under a 1.5 degree carbon budget. So that's really um, positive, and we want to see more countries embracing that 50% absolute by 2030 commitment. And then the First Movers Coalition the next day, which is also kind of a uh, industry mobilization effort. But for NDC negotiations moving forward on shipping, one thing to keep an eye on is whether your country includes shipping and aviation in their NDC. So a lot of countries, they technically were not, there was a loophole in Paris that enabled a lot of countries to not report shipping and aviation emissions. So we're trying to get all countries to say, you know, every country in the world should take responsibility for 50% of the inbound and outbound emissions that come from every ship and every plane that travels the world, because otherwise no one's accounting for those. So the UK, the US, a few countries, um, well, obviously first modeled by Marshall Islands and a number of leaders. Um, yeah, so just a handful of countries have started to do that. So if you're, would love to chat with you about that. Um, if, you know, that's a great way to push formal accounting into the UNFCCC process. And Sean, do you have any, any things you'd like to see from COP and any negotiations that you're following closely? And then it has allegation there on the ground that the peanut plant, uh, we want to see peanuts as a carbon recognized and it's not just as a sugar plant, but of course it's an energy effort to decarbonize generally. That's our business now, and that's unfortunate for the business, but the business is doing this, and we actually do have to do these expenses. So the first mission of the impact of the carbon is happening. Is 
Thanks, Sean. I, I don't think we have John on the line, but we're just checking. No, I, th I think we don't have John. So does anyone else uh, have any more questions? Another question? I, I have a question for Madeline, if you wouldn't mind. When you're uh, trying to pressure uh, companies like IKEA to ship zero, I imagine they use quite large shipping agents like Maersk and stuff. How, 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 do you, how do they tell a large shipping company how they want their goods shipped and, and how much leverage do they have to, to say how they want their goods shipped? Yeah, I mean, the whole theory of change of the Ship at Zero campaign was to create demand for a zero emission vessel market. Um, but, you know, there was just this chicken and egg problem for decades. <laughs> um, for about the last two decades, there's been this finger pointing problem in the shipping industry where shippers say, you know, it's not our fault. Like customers don't say they want a zero emission ship. And then, you know, or it's not all our fault. The ports don't have zero emission fuels. And, you know, there's been a lot of finger pointing. So we just decided let's, you know, solve the chicken and egg problem and make someone step up and ask for zero emission shipping options. So that's sort of, the, that was sort of the theory of change. So, um, so far, Amazon, Ikea, Patagonia, REI, um, a handful, about 20 countries companies uh, have committed to moving their products off of fossil fuel ships completely by 2040. Uh, and we've since then, there have been like over seven, eight billion dollars invested in a whole new generation of, they're not zero emission, but they're carbon neutral cargo ships powered by e-methanol. So it, it's really just about getting folks to step up within the whole value chain um, and just to get that sort of impetus moving. Do we have any more questions? If not, we might close there. So thank you to all the speakers. It's really kind of you to, to give up your time and, and energy today. And here's hoping we do something about black carbon. Eh? Thank you. I'm going to say thank you to the speakers and thank you, Robbie, for stepping in for Pam at the end as well as stepping in as a climate scientist and speaking to, to lead us off today. Thank you very much. Thanks, John.